So we've already given our initial reactions in regards to the trailer that Bungie dropped yesterday. However, Luke and I have done some deep diving on this, essentially stopping things frame by frame to give you a little more context to what we've seen in the trailer, including the return of some old weapons. So let's open up with some of the timestamps here. First up at two seconds, all the way to eight seconds, we actually hear Savathun say, what is the relic on Mars? And it appears that our crafting will take place on Mars, similar to like communing with the darkness on Europa, or in fact, it could be a separate social space. We've actually seen the same set of stairs in the weapon crafting segment in the Vida. Now, Savathun alluding to the relic on Mars also continue to say the power to create your own weapons. So from a lore perspective, we actually think Savathun is going to play a major role in helping us acquire the ability to craft our own weapons. Now, is this space going to be tied to her ship, the place the Traveler touches the planet? From the interview that we covered yesterday from James Sai, quote, the reason we have this relic is that we wanted this to feel like a personal, sacred, and emotional emotionally intimate moment for you and give it some importance in the universe. Meaning, good chance it's going to be tied to Savathun and pretty much probably the entire campaign. Now, could this relic be from the Golden Age when the Traveler blessed the solar system with both physical and technological innovation? Who knows? But it's obviously meant to hold some level of importance, both in its lore aspect, its narrative, and of course, the fact that we can craft weapons. Now, moving on to six and seven seconds, the frame around the weapon glows as if some paracausal force is bringing shape to the weapon. There's like this orange orange aura surrounding the relic, by the way, and other casts in the room that grows after the blade has been placed down. Now, this relic, whether light or dark, may be using that power to fashion our new weapon. Now, in 11 seconds, you actually do get to see the perk selections being chosen. Again, like we mentioned in yesterday's video, everything is customizable, from the magazine perk to the barrel perk to the masterworks. There doesn't appear to be any extra modifiers, though, and there also doesn't seem to be any changes in intrinsic perks, which that was something we were questioning. That would have taken customization to a whole new level. Like if you took a 150 round per minute scout rifle, could you convert it to a 200 or a 180? Now, per the Game Informer article, weapon crafting starts with a pattern, which can be used to create the initial form of a given weapon. And using that weapon in combat gains levels that enable you to further tweak its capabilities. This includes intrinsic properties like range or handling increases to the magazine attributes and other more consequential adjustments. Eventually, you'll be able to alter its core traits and perks like rampage or killing weapons. Win. So again, giving us more information here, but essentially fully customization outside of a leap there in archetypes. Now I will say here, the language here does seem to suggest that we can alter the actual stat distribution of the weapon, like stability, handling, range, etc. And down the line, through more extensive use, we can change the actual parts and core traits of the weapon. We talked about the possibility of intrinsic traits coming back to our weapons and archetype frames being the main differentiating factor between weapons of the same class. So again, over time, could we actually be able to adjust these frames in order to personalize our weapons even further? And are the changes here in our stats just purely tied to the masterwork or with use over time, will we also be able to affect that? Now, DMG has already let us know that this Thursday, we're going to actually have a weapon focused twap. This is going to give us more insight probably on weapon crafting and of course the upcoming sandbox. So be looking out for that. Now at 11 seconds and 16 seconds, we actually get to see the selection here of this energy in what appears to be an auto rifle. Now, yesterday I said it was a scout rifle because I saw triple tap and of course dragonfly and so my assumption was that it was a scout rifle but when you actually see it firing you see the mag size being 29 working its way down so considering like the magazine size and such I'm actually thinking this could potentially be either a 360 round per minute auto rifle or maybe a 450. Now some things about the crafting though you really don't have that many perk selections at least initially especially in the trait column on this auto rifle specifically we see genesis triple tap shoot to loot perpetual motion and that's it just those four, which does seem very limiting. However, what we do know is over time, when we get kills with that weapon or something, this should unlock further customization. Now at 18 seconds, it shows us finding Scorn on Mars. Now we've already seen Scorn in the throne world. You can actually see our breakdown of this trailer here where we went over this, but now we have confirmation that we're going to be finding them in multiple locations. The question we still haven't answered though, is who is controlling them? The darkness? Callus? Savathic? By the way, next week, we're going to be doing a lore deep dive with Mylan himself, please come by and check that out. All these questions right here, we're going to be asking. And if you're like me and you're forgetful and you need a reminder, just hit the subscribe button. I'll remind you every day next week. Now, moving on to the exotic portion, because that was the part that everyone was getting hyped for. At 21 seconds to 26, we get to see the Grand Overture Slug Launcher. Now, this looks to do arc damage, of course, and fires extremely fast. And if you notice right off the bat, yes, Cabal themed. That's essentially the Cabal Slug Launcher. Now, it does put a text there at the bottom stating that this is a season pass required weapon. So most 
likely it will be the exotic you receive from buying Season of Redacted with the launch of Witch Queen. Now, we don't have a slug launcher weapon type, so we can presume this will fit into the machine gun category, or it can just be its very own thing. What we do know, confirmed Cabal, though, charges full auto missiles. Think sweet business, but instead of just bullets, you're firing these missiles. And it also appears to have two different rates of fire. Could just be the trailer slowing down, which is possible, but maybe there's a focus fire and rapid fire option present on this weapon. Not something we see often, right? But think of like Surus Regime and its ability to swap fire types. Greatly affects the damage, right? Now, 26 seconds to 32, we see the Parasite Worm Launcher fire an actual worm at enemies. Now, you guys were nicknaming this yesterday as the Fetus Yetus. And I will say, when the time comes and we make a review of this weapon, on the thumbnail, I will literally call it Fetus Yetus just for you. Now, the description for this weapon says that it deals increasing damage. Now, is this based on the kills that it does? Is it the damage itself or the number of shots left in the magazine? We do know that Full Court is a perk that does increase detonation damage with airtime. And this worm was getting a hell of a lot of airtime here. Now, this most likely will be an exotic. There will be more extensive than that. Either way, there's something ironic about killing Savathun with a worm of all things. Now, moving on to 32 seconds to 38, we see Osseo Striga. And this weapon is shooting projectiles. And somebody pointed it out yesterday in the stream. This actually has a very similar fire pattern to that of the Needler. Now, I know it's an SMG. And a lot of people are like, yo, it's Recluse with a thorn ornament. But you see the projectiles tracking enemies and spreading corruption on successful kills. Now, the corruption does damage over time, similar to Necrotic Grips and Thorn. You can see the green pulses leaving enemies, with also the Acolyte and High Wizard dying to the damage over time effect. However, it was oddly curious that the death of the wizard occurred at the reload. Now, maybe that was damage over time, but maybe it has like a malfeasance effect where you like do a number of shots and then when you go to reload, it actually does a detonation or full damage effect to whatever it is you pumped a lot of damage into. Now, 40 seconds, we get to see the Tyne armor, which kind of looks suspiciously like Kynos. We see a hunter also wearing similar armor at 47 seconds. It's like the Cabal are assisting us in our fight against the darkness and we acquire new Cabal themed armor sets for our guardians. Now, lore wise, that's exactly what's happening. We know even right now going on this season, Kaido and her forces have actually been tied up with Zivu at the reef. But considering the weapons, the armor, everything, everything seems to be centered, at least from what we've seen here around Cabal, thus strengthening our alliance with the Cabal even more. Now, moving on to the glaive section, 41 seconds of 42, you actually see the Titan glaive called Edge of Action. It's got the ability to, of course, pop that protective shield on the ground, very similar to a Titan bubble. The questions that we have, does it have as much strength and defense as a regular bubble? Can you get an overshield from it if you're pairing it with the likes of Saint 14? Do you get weapons of light? If we actually do see Glass House back in the game, will it synergize? Now, 44 seconds and 46, the Warlock Glaive is called Edge of Intent. Its ability is to deploy a healing turret, very similar to like Noble Rounds from Lumina or even Boots of the Similar for the Rift. And the question that comes up, of course, how does this synergize with those exotics? And at 40 seconds and 51 seconds, you see the Hunter Glaive called Edge of Concurrence. Its ability is to launch a trail of chain lightning across the ground that tracks enemies. And then upon impact, it does a chain lightning effect similar to that of like Trinity Ghoul, but it actually seems like it has a girthier blast. Now the exotic armor portion. At 52 seconds, 55 through 58, you can see up close the new Titan exotic, Horfrost. Now this actually replaces your barricade with an actual stasis wall. A slightly lower middle crystal with the sides on either side being much taller. Now, what I mentioned yesterday would be amazing if you can can utilize this on all classes. I don't know if that's going to be the case. This may actually be another Mask of the Backer scenario where it will only work on Behemoth, but there's still so much you could do with this. You can literally zone off an entire control point. I can see so many trial games getting clutched up because of this one exotic. And inside of PvE, can you imagine doing something like this before a damage phase, say an Avarice, where you can cast the wall on one side and keep all those enemies from shooting you from the side and flinching you up? Now, 53 seconds, as well as 58 and a minute and two, we see the Warlock gauntlets. Osmio Mancy. Now, this actually grants you two cold snap grenades, similar to that of Starfire Protocol. Now, say it has enhanced seeking, which is great and all. Personally, though, I'm looking forward to double Bleak Watcher turrets. Can you imagine stacking something like this with double grenade kickstart and a demolitionist weapon? You'll have Stacy's everywhere. Now, at 54 seconds, as well as a minute four and minute 10, you see the Hunter Helmet Blight Ranger. Now, this actually increases that Arc Strider reflection damage. Now, it's a sexy looking exotic. Question 
question is, is how useful is this exotic actually going to be? Now, we already see from like Ruin Guard and Arc Strider that when you actually deflect projectiles, this triples Arc Staff damage. So you can already see some of the synergy there. The problem is, are we going to be facing enough enemies that's going to be shooting out enough projectiles for us to deflect? And how much damage are we talking about? However, I will say this. One of the most annoying supers to go against inside of Crucible is a Middle Tree Arc Strider. I pop my hammers and they start trolling. I can't do anything except maybe hit the ground and hope he doesn't shoot it back at me. The point I'm trying to make is Hive Light Bearers are going to be a normal thing in Witch Queen. Therefore, an exotic that is reflecting back Nova Bombs and Sentinel Shields and Blade Barrages, this Hunter Exotic Blight Ranger might actually be the play. Now, moving on at 58 seconds, we do see the Iron Banner Hand Cannon. I put a poll out yesterday asking people on Twitch what people thought this hand cannon was going to be archetype wise and a lot of people said 180 we'll see though and before you get upset about 180s tomorrow we're getting the twab about weapons i am really hopeful we may see some buffs here for some left behind archetypes 180 round per minute hand cannons is definitely one of those now at a minute four to a minute nine minute 11 minute 14 and minute 20 you see the titan wearing a flaming helmet now some people have already speculated that this is an ornament for eternal warrior but eternal warriors for striker titans we see the titan here using a sunbreaker super so unless they buff a Eternal Warrior to give it an overshield for multiple supers, which wouldn't be the first time Bungie has buffed an exotic to make it more viable outside of its intended subclass. This should be a new exotic. I never know anymore, guys, because Bungie does sprinkle in ornaments into their trailers, right? That's part of the selling point. I get it. Now, at a minute and nine seconds, pointed out this morning, and I actually thought this man was lying. I thought he photoshopped this, but Dominic noticed an Amelon pulse rifle that was being dropped. Now, what's interesting about this is that we have not seen an Amelon pulse rifle in a very long time but we have a number of them from year one that were actually pretty good nurgle a grana i'm saying that right agenda i really can't figure out which one exactly this one is personally i hope it's nurgle nurgle was one of the best weapons in destiny 2 year one during the beta now the only legendary lightweight in the game right now pulse rifle wise is chattering bone and before you say the br is a lightweight technically it's not though it doesn't have the lightweight benefits like increased movement speed handling etc it's its own thing and i know we've had exotic like Outbreak Perfected that's also in that same archetype but it's not really a lightweight. We have not gotten a lightweight pulse rifle in a long time and not only a lightweight pulse rifle a lightweight Amelon pulse rifle. Could tomorrow actually give us some news of an actual lightweight pulse rifle buff? That would be nuts. Now we also see an auto rifle being dropped here by the hunter which just appears to be the throne world auto rifle from earlier in the trailer. Now a minute and 14 seconds we have some hunter arms here that we haven't seen before. Now maybe it's an ornament or it could actually be a new exotic. Now let's did bring up yesterday that every big expansion does bring two new exotics per class. So this could actually be giving us a peek at the Hunter exotic and of course the Titan exotic we saw a second ago. The only one we have not seen is the Warlock. Now as a final note here, for my folks that like lore, at a minute and 23 seconds, another detail that we actually missed in previous trailers calling back to the alchemy theme of this expansion, the eclipse taking place in the outro graphic. Now this eclipse represents a marriage between the sun, masculine, and moon feminine. The light and the darkness coming together to form a perfect union and get this the man is usually depicted wearing red and gold clothing to depict his solar aspects and the woman is depicted wearing a crown now this describes the exact relationship between Sabathun and Osiris after his possession guys it's truly incredible what the lore team goes into the design not only on the story that stands on its own but a construct of themes that derive inspiration from real life history now we do have a couple websites we pulled this data from and of course we talked about all of this when diving to like the alchemical symbols, what they mean, what we're speculating. It's actually pretty amazing. And again, next week, we'll be doing that lore episode with Mylan. I'll have a list of questions. Feel free to comment down below what questions you want us to ask, some things that you may be curious about, and we'll make sure to add them to the list. Well, fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.